everyone good good afternoon wherever you are welcome to this side event uh, for the uh, opening day of the ffd forum on not waving but drowning managing liquidity and solvency in a world of cascading crises um, i've just come back from the imf meetings in, in washington uh, there's a real concern, of course, about the state of the global economy, but there is also a disconnect between the understanding of the seriousness of the crisis and the, and the response to it. I, I, there's a lot of talk, of course, about crises on top of crises, which is, of course is quite true. Um, there are also crises, a series of crises for which developing countries have had no responsibility, but are suffering the consequences of and the need to think hard about the kind of international financial system we have and the mechanisms at our disposal to deal with these kinds of shocks I think is a very urgent one and we hope that today's uh, webinar will give at least a sense of the kind of work that we do in UNCTAD in response to the fragilities and uncertainties in the in the global system uh, we we will present some of the work that we do, that we do with ourselves and with colleagues at Boston University, um, that trying to track the extent of the crisis to try and uh, present an alternative narrative that can offer uh, alternatives to uh, the, the current weaknesses in the, in the system. Uh, we have a, a great panel. I, I will introduce people as we go through and uh, through, through the through the webinar, we will start with my colleague uh, Penelope Hawkins, who will introduce some of the work that we've been doing in UNCTAD, both on the short-term response liquidity uh, mechanisms uh, to deal with these shocks, as well as uh, the, the the larger questions around development finance and the need for alternative thinking to ensure that developing countries have access to the uh, appropriate degrees of finance at the at the appropriate cost. So Penelope, I'm going to um, hand over to you. I, I would ask people to put questions into the chat that they, if people have questions or comments, please put them into the the chat, and we'll respond and we'll respond as best we can in the in the time that we have. Penelope, uh, the screen is yours. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, and thank you for framing the session um, in terms of this huge disconnect between countries um, that are advanced and countries that are developing in terms of the way forward and the nature of the crises and how they've undermined development in many of the developing countries. And I guess that puts us in this context of uh, policymakers, particularly in developing countries, being under extreme pressure to rise to the consequences of all this cascade of currencies, uh, crises. Um, but the question remains, of where are the tools that enable them to do that? And today I'm presenting two of the tools um, that were developed as part of the UN response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which included the issuing of five new development account projects, which are really designed to provide technical assistance to member states. And the work that I'm talking about here um, all falls, falls under the rubric of UNCTAD's project, Response and Recovery, Mobilizing Financial Resources for Development in the Time of COVID-19. Now, the project was coordinated with, um, in Rich's division under the Debt and Development Finance Branch um, and has been jointly implemented with colleagues at ECA, ECLAC and ESCAP. Um, and really, the aim of the project is to enable member countries to diagnose their fragilities in the global and regional context and identify and design appropriate policy responses, which can lead to recovery and return to a sustainable development path. Before I, I um, introduce you to these tools, I'd just like to let you know that you can find out more about the project and indeed those tools at the project website. Um, which is mobilizing with a Z, mobilizingdevfinance.org. I'll also put that in the chat and there you can find reports and new information about the project 
So the first tool I'd like to develop, uh, present today is the Sustainable Development Finance Assessment Framework, which has really been developed for developing country policymakers with a view to enabling them to assess their external and public sector financial needs against the investment requirements arising from the Sustainable Development Goals and against the need to achieve external finance, external debt and public sector um, sustainability. So for this version of the project, um, we have focused on SDGs 1 to 4, which of course, as you know, embraces no poverty, no hunger, um, good access to health services and quality education. So in this way, we actually see this framework as identifying development finance needs within countries to achieve structural transformation as represented by SDGs within the bounds of their external position. And as such, of course, the way we see it is that the sustainable development finance assessment goes beyond standard development uh, debt sustainability assessments, um, which tend to focus far more narrowly on the financial needs associated with paying off existing sovereign debt. So the SDFA framework assumes that for countries that do not issue international reserve currencies, the balance of payments constraint, of course, is the one that binds and constrains output and growth in developing countries. Um, it also considers not only exports of goods and services as a source of foreign currency, but also gross remittances. And it considers all sorts of sources of financial capital uh, that finance the country's uh, current account deficit. And that would include external debt, foreign direct investment and portfolio investment um, in the domestic market. So um, what we have done so far is that we have developed this model. We've undertaken country analysis utilizing the SDFA framework um, and public data that's available uh, for these countries. Um, we are also currently undertaking work to develop the policymakers dashboard, which would allow policymakers um, the ability to dial up or down SDG expenditure and evaluate the implications for um, output growth and debt sustainability. The work so far has made it very clear that the model has some predictive capacity. So taking the slightly historical data from countries, we now can point to situations that are currently playing out. Um, of course, what is also real, uh, the reality of this model is that it provides complex outcomes, which I think is befitting of a model of this sort. So I think one of the things that one has to realize with this kind of model is that the capacity of developing countries to sustain a growth path that enables structural transformation depends on their ability to manage external liabilities and avoid an explosive debt path. And the problem is really independent of the specific form of those external liabilities. And I think sometimes we don't emphasize this enough when we urge countries to attract FDI, um, but that of course, that as the stock of foreign capital increases, um, the demand in terms of payments out of those countries to service those financial investments become grow, uh, grow and grow and increase in proportion. And of course, the more the proportion of that service account grows, there will be less room for importing capital goods uh, with the export resources. Raoul Prebisch, who was the first secretary of UNCTAD, stressed this problem in 1949, and it remains true today. For example, a country may be in a situation of unsustainable external finance in the long run, with the country's growth rate of exports and remittances not enough to offset the growth of imports and the average net cost of its external liabilities. At the same time, the scenario may be aggravated by an unsustainable trend in public debt, where in order to achieve public debt sustainability with the achievement of the SDGs, higher than average growth rates have to be achieved, taking into account the current cost of the existing debt. And it's exactly here where the model starts to show trade-offs. Unless export earnings can be raised and the cost of the net external liabilities be reduced, which is very often out of the control of developing countries, external finance stability, sustainability requires lower growth rates 
than the historical averages. And consequently, there's this interplay with having to subdue growth to pay for external obligations in the long run, but of course, then also in the long run, resulting in lower tax revenues, eventually translating into higher public debt over the long run and reinforcing the unsustainable trend of public debt. And so what we would say so far is that this framework provides insights into pos pos possible policy decisions, such as raising exports, lowering expenditure on SDGs, as well as making it appar apparent that to enable a country to sustainably achieve the SDGs, and in this case, we're only looking at the first four of those, um, external debt restructuring, including debt cancellation, may become necessary and sometimes inevitable. So we would like to see the tool um, that we have developed so far um, forming part of our ongoing work. It's not just going to be a project. Um, it will be, um, it's, you know, it's continuing to be developed um, and also expanded in terms of the SDGs that it will cover. So we're currently involved in a new development account project where we will expand the SDGs to those that focus specifically on climate change and mitigation. And we're also extending the policymakers dashboard with a view to also analyze more countries. So that's really the work that we're trying to do around the solvency issue. But then, of course, we're also doing some work on liquidity. And that's the work that Richard's already um, referred to as work that we're doing with Boston University and Freya Universität in Berlin, um, which is really the development of the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker. Um, and this is really a very useful visual tool um, that allows developing countries to actually see both the potential and actual liquidity provision provided on a global, regional, and bilateral level for UN member countries during the COVID crisis. Now, we know that the global financial safety net really is provided by a whole set of institutions that provide balance of payments finance to countries in temporary financial distress. But what is immediately apparent from uh, this global financial safety net tracker is that the provision of liquidity is highly une unequal between different groups of countries. And effectively, high income countries are insured, uh, over insured, you almost might say, by the global financial safety net compared to low income countries. And with low and middle income countries already exposed to ever increasing risk of debt service payments that are likely to be increased further because of the unresolved pandemic and recovery, not to mention the war in UK, Ukraine and the expected monetary policy tightening in developed countries, um, it's really disturbing that the GFSN does not support all country income groups adequately who are facing global liquidity risk. And so while the liquidity needs of low and middle income countries um, are inadequately created for, the advanced high income countries are awash with third party crisis financial resources in relative terms. And then of course, there's some upper middle income countries somewhere in the middle. For the analysis of our tracker, we collected data for conditional and unconditional emergency lending by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, regional financial um, arrangements, RFAs, and bilateral currency swap arrangements between central banks during the pandemic. And to the best of our knowledge, the tracker is the only publicly available tool that gathers, gathers information on swaps. And we visited every single page of the central banks uh, several times during the pandemic. So on top of compiling information on the most relevant sources of short-term liquidity to the UN member states, the GFSN tracker is unique in gathering information on swap agreements, including not only swaps offered by advanced economies, but also among emerging market economies. Our analysis highlights three main aspects. First of all, the global financial safety net um, is really not global to the extent that this might imply equivalent or equal coverage. Essentially, the higher a country's income level, the more diverse is the crisis insurance. Advanced high income countries and to a low degree, some emerging high income countries can widely draw on swaps, which is a very convenient and quick an unconditional option 
of liquidity access in hard currency. For low income countries and lower middle income countries, there is far less availability of these swaps and a much higher degree of rely reliance on standard and conditional IMF lending. This is especially problematic as low and middle income countries are facing this slower and unequal economic recovery from COVID. Second, the regional reserve funds play a marginal role in the pandemic. Um, and despite the fact that they've grown quite significantly as a source of emergency funding, um, and some particular intensive use of these funds in the past, right, they were certainly very selectively used in the current crisis. And finally, the tracker reveals that the IMF is no longer the single most important crisis prevention or backstop for all income groups. This is mostly due to preference for bilateral central bank currency swaps by those countries that can get access to them. Swaps are offered especially by the US Federal, Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China, but also by an increasing number of other central banks of advanced and emerging market economies. Bilateral agreements do not only reinforce inequality in the global financial safety net, but also risk sidelining multilateral institutions, both at the global and regional level, in particular for those higher income groups that can choose where to obtain emergency liquidity. So addressing a temporary liquidity crisis quickly and comprehensively um, can prevent it from transforming into a solvency crisis. And we argue in our work that inequality in the global financial safety net is a potential source of solvency concern, uh, for, sorry, liquidity concern for countries that have less choice and access um, to voluminous disbursement of emergency liquidity with adequate policy conditionality. I think these tools really are things that we would like to um, highlight as potential aids to policymakers in developing countries. And I would again encourage you to access our web page and explore um, the updated page from time to time. The project closes in June, but we will continue to develop this work going forward um, and keep it updated. Thank you, Richard. Great, thanks uh, for that introduction, uh, Penelope. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Andres uh, Arauz. Andres is a, a senior research fellow at uh, CEPR in the think tank in, in Washington. And, and, and before that spent many years at the Ecuadorian uh, Central Bank. And of course, Ecuador is a middle income country coming again, coming out of, of Washington last week. There's a lot of frustration in middle income countries in particular, in terms of the support that they receive, both on the liquidity front and in terms of their debt positions, um, that, that somehow they are often particularly neglected in the, in the discussions in, in, in the international uh, financial system. So, Andres, I think you're in a perfect position, really, to discuss some of the issues that, that Penelope has raised in, from the work that we're doing. So, we'd very much appreciate your thoughts and comments on the challenges facing particularly middle-income countries in the system. Thank you, uh, Richard, and uh, thanks, uh, Penelope, for that uh, great explanation on both the Sustainable Development Goal of Financing Assessment, uh, the work that UNCTAD does, and also uh, on the description on the global financial safety net. Well, really, uh, what uh, we are undergoing right now is a, is a crisis, like you mentioned, both in the liquidity and the solvency phase. And, uh, uh, developing countries are under severe pressure with not enough instruments available for them to, to take uh, action right now. We've seen uh, very, very small steps from uh, the multilateral institutions such as the IMF, uh, for example, recently issued a, a review on its uh, position regarding capital flow management uh, measures, right? So basically capital controls and uh, the, the way it's moving is extremely slow and with very little force. 
uh, relative to what needs to be done in, in the context uh, like that of the pandemic or the post-pandemic and now the situation uh, around the world given the rise in, in food prices, volatile capital flows, and unfortunately uh, rapidly increasing uh, interest rates for most of the uh, developing world's uh, external debt service. And of course, uh, policy tightening in the central countries that will definitely affect uh, uh, most of the uh, developing world, especially in middle income countries that have been sort of making an effort to integrate in terms of capital markets. Now they're going to face uh, very strong pressures, uh, uh, both to their budgets in terms of uh, debt service, but also to their uh, foreign currency uh, reserves and their possibility to, to continue having a reasonably uh, sustained uh, balance of payments. So uh, as you mentioned, the restriction comes from the balance of payments and, and we need to find you know, all, all measures that, that can help in that direction. And uh, I was just, uh, <clears throat> of course we know many of them and you have already uh, discussed the importance of having a, a regional financial arrangements that are adequate in scale and magnitude given the situation that can be swift, that can be quick, that do not depend on having IMF program conditionality because many of the regional financial arrangements uh, usually require, you know, a, a sort of an, an, an IMF checklist before that. And, and then, you know, that sort of beats the point because the process of negotiating that with the Washington-based institution may take too long. Um, we need uh, uh, <clears throat> swaps, but that depend less on geopolitical interests of those who are behind them, and that can be built on, on a sort of multilateral framework uh, that respects uh, sovereignty and that has, you know, a safety net philosophy behind it, rather than a sort of trade promotion or a, a geopolitical interest. In the case of, for example, the U.S., when they have, you know, these uh, unlimited swap lines with select partners. Uh, and then uh, basically a, a, a second tier of, of limited swaps with, with, with a, another group of allies, and then basically nothing for everybody else without really going into systemic considerations, but rather geopolitical alliances. At least that's how I see it. And, but I think that uh, the last uh, seven months did see another instrument pop up that has not been discussed enough and that I think has huge potential. And I'm talking about special drawing rights, right? Both in terms of a financial safety net uh, instrument that we should try to incorporate as part of the global financial safety net, both for liquidity and solvency reasons, and I will detail that in a bit, but then also as part of what we should become accustomed to thinking the link between special drawing rights and sustainable development goals. Hopefully one day we, we will call them still SDRs, but because they are uh, sustainable development rights, right? <laughs> drawing rights. So I think uh, uh, they, they are a powerful instrument and uh, I'd like to uh, share just a, a few graphs. Uh, if you allow me, I, I will go ahead and, and share the slide. Um, of a recent report that we published just last week that I think will be of, of interest. I, I won't take long, I, I promise. Very, very quickly, I'll just show a few powerful graphs uh, uh, to make my point. So something that we already know, how the crisis is asymmetric in terms of how it affects growth uh, of uh, developing economies versus the advanced economies, especially low-income economies are severely affected uh, from the impact of the pandemic, and that will last for a while, including, uh, unfortunately, con having to resort to conditional access to large, or what the IMF calls upper tranche loans, uh, with the entire policy conditionality that comes with them. And then I like this, uh, this chart a lot uh, by the IMF uh, that shows the magnitude of the responses to the COVID shock uh, from advanced economies and comparing that to uh, developing countries and especially low-income countries. I mean, the, the magnitude of, of how the, the, the richer countries intervened in the economy with revenue uh, sacrifices and spending measures, are, I mean, the, <laughs> this is huge. Uh, 
uh, this this has seen. I mean, I have never seen something this uh, big, uh, and this is not even covering or relative to sustainable development needs, right? So if we would make this relative to the needs uh, for investment uh, in terms of sustainable development, uh, I mean, this would overshoot in the case of advanced economies, and it would still be a minute kind of a fraction of what emerging and low-income countries would need in terms of their development needs or sustainable development needs. So seeing this graph as, in the context of the untagged assessments would be extremely valuable, uh, for example. Now, special drawing rights can have many uses. We have traditionally thought of SDRs only as a reserve asset, but this the experience since last year shows that it has been really uh, possible to use it for many reasons, right? Both for liquidity in terms of balance of payments needs, sure. Yes, many countries have used it for that purpose, but now, and this is something that I've been pushing uh, since the time I was in the Central Bank of Ecuador, and most recently with a bunch of op-eds and, and some reports, uh, we need to use SDRs as a fiscal instrument. And I'm happy to, to report that over 69 countries uh, have used SDRs as a budget support measure. Okay, so now that's very important and it sort of changes the discussion on what this instrument can do, especially in the context of uh, developing countries. Now, uh, you can see that for liquidity, you know, you can use it for balance of payments purposes to cover shortfalls in terms of the reserves, but you can also uh, uh, avoid or prevent or help or mitigate, you know, solvency crisis if we start using SDRs in an intelligent manner. And that's using it as a fiscal instrument both to avoid new debt, you know, because if you, if you have these resources and you spend them, you avoid having to go to the capital markets or knock on the IMF store for a loan, but you can even pay back uh, previous IMF loans with the new SDRs, which we have labeled uh, IMF re debt relief because you don't, um, uh, you don't have to deploy previous budget resources for that uh, purposes. Now, uh, in terms of liquidity, uh, you see that many countries, especially the uh, uh, vulnerable countries have, uh, I mean, the, the new allocation of SDRs was a significant proportion of their international reserves. This was a huge boost. Just with that, it would have been good enough. Uh, but like I said, we had to go deeper and try to make it a solvency instrument, a fiscal instrument. So uh, we saw how the, the SDRs could help in terms of debt service. This is only a comparative uh, graph, and it shows that it can have an incidence, perhaps not enough, but still much larger than what we uh, see uh, next, which is how the allocation of SDRs compares to other solvency-related initiatives in the last few uh, months, right? Uh, for example, DSSI, the Debt Suspension Initiative, it not only is it tiny, not only does it cover very few countries, but it doesn't really do away with that. It just helps, you know, in, in the short term in terms of liquidity, and it pales in comparison with uh, the SDR location. So if you see, for example, the, the second grouping here, the SSI 68 countries, only a, a 6.9 or $7 billion worth of uh, DSSI uh, was... Uh, basically suspended, uh, that service was suspended, while allocation to the same countries that benefit, benefited from the SSI was over $26 billion, okay? So that, that shows the scale. And then um, if we see the, the sorry, it's th only 3.4 billion was suspended while 6.9 was the potential for the suspension. And if you compare it to other initiatives like the CCRT, which is a special fund of the IMF to sort of help countries that are undergoing uh, major natural disasters, the uh, debt relief was only $1 billion in this huge crisis that the world is living through uh, when the allocation to the same countries that benefited from CCRT was over 8 billion, right? Still too little, but extremely, uh, I mean, much, much larger than any sort of these debt relief measures uh, could have been. So um, 
this this shows that the the magnitude is is still not there, but much larger than anything else that has happened in the past. This is sort of a theoretical scheme of how debt relief would, would occur. I'm not going to, to get into that right now, but basically we're saying, look, SDRs are created out of thin air. They are issued and allocated to countries and then countries can basically use it to pay back former IMF debt. So because this is new money that didn't used to exist before, you can literally consider this debt relief. Now, sure, there's a tiny uh, SDR rate that has to be paid on, on the net amount of SDRs that have gone used, and but it's a negligible cost, you know, compared to the principal or, or the amount of SDRs that have been used by, by the countries. 98 countries use the SDRs, and as you can see from this map, it's basically the developing world. It's basically the developing world with vulnerable countries, low-income countries, they use the SDRs in one way or another. Most of them actually for fiscal purposes. Like I said, 69 countries use the SDR for fiscal purposes, which opens the way for a more profound discussion on this very powerful uh, instrument. Uh, how was this use concentrated? Well, mostly, most countries in Africa use them. A bunch of the countries in, in the Central America and the Caribbean uh, also in Latin America. And well, you can see the distribution here. I will share the slides uh, with you in case the participants also like, like to access uh, them. And uh, uh, by income group, we see that, you know, the, the main users of the SDRs by far were the low income countries. So uh, in, in terms of the liquidity needs, but in terms of the solvency needs or using them as a fiscal instrument, it was actually middle income countries that most benefited both in absolute and relative terms. So we see that um, this is a, a good opportunity in my country in Ecuador, <laughs> the, country, uh, the government was preemptive about receiving the SDRs just like it was in the 2009 allocation. And it basically meant that uh, even though the IMF requested very strict sort of monetary financing uh, prohibitions in terms of the central bank granting funding for the government, and an exception was made for the SDRs where the SDRs were directly transferred to the property of the government so that they could be used as uh, fiscal spending in the 2021 budget. So. Uh, we see that it was a valuable instrument and prevented Ecuador, literally, and we have statements uh, confirming this, prevented Ecuador from growing to the international capital markets in the context of a pandemic, because now you had uh, these uh, funds available for, for spending. Um, so here you have a, a more uh, detailed uh, use. I, I won't go into all the details, but basically uh, the point I want to make is the countries took advantage of this. It was a helpful instrument. We wish there were more of these uh, and we wish they were linked to the uh, sustainable development goals, right? So if we can eventually start working, and this may take a decade, but if we start working on changing the logic of how the SDRs are allocated, both to get a larger allocation and to have it more finely tuned in terms of its targeting so that it reaches countries in need of investment for sustainable development purposes, I think this would be a, a good opportunity. And finally, just to come, uh, just to align that I'd like to end with, look, we're now uh, seeing this, this uh, the effects of uh, food crisis, uh, you know, energy crisis and, and the post pandemic. And, and the, the lot can be done with the previously issued SDR, just so you have an idea. If only the rich countries, the advanced economies, according to the IMF, 25% of all of their SDR holdings, 25%, they were donated on behalf of the rest of the world's debt to the IMF, the entire IMF debt, so what countries owe to the IMF, could be stricken off in one go with 25% of the recent of the SDR holdings that they have. And they would still have more SDRs and more reserve assets than they had in July 2021. So this is the scale of something that can be done for immediate debt relief. The magnitude for World Bank debt is similar. It's a little larger, but the idea is the same. And we have to start thinking about these bold measures 
that could uh, mean an important opportunity uh, for, uh, for countries. And just a final comment to end on, if we, uh, something that I think is very important for, for developing countries is that these crises should not only uh, be uh, an opportunity to have more instruments in terms of the macroeconomic management, but this should be the seed for transformational change in agricultural and industrial policies. We have to realize that we do not have to be so vulnerable and so dependent on the, on the happenings of the international volatility. We need to have sovereign agricultural and industrial policies that support structural transformation, that support the objectives of sovereignty that developing countries uh, need around the world. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Andreas. And I, I think, I mean, the, the CEPR paper is a great paper. I think it's available on the CEPR website. If I'm, I'm not mistaken, I would encourage, yeah. I would encourage people to, um, to take a look at it because there's a huge amount of detail in there that is, I think, valuable and, and, and definitely worth uh, looking at. Let me turn now to Professor Hai Hong Gao, who is the director of research at the Center for International Finance at the Institute of World Economics and Politics um, in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Um, Hai Hong also serves as the co-chair of the T20 uh, Task Force on International Finance and Economic Recovery, which is under Indonesia, I guess, uh, this year. Um, uh, of course, China has a very specific role in the international financial system and an increasingly important one. Uh, but Hai Hang has also worked extensively on the question of the global financial safety net and its, and it, its weaknesses. And so perhaps Hai Hang, you can uh, give your reflections on, on the kinds of challenges that we're, we're discussing here today. Right. Thank you, uh, Richard, for your introduction. I'm going to share my um... Uh, Can I just remind people if they have questions to put them in the chat or in the Q and A as well. So we'll have a little, hopefully, a little time at the end to to, to respond to any comments or questions people have. So, can you see my slides? Is it okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, right. Thank you so much. I, I'm so happy to be in the panel. Um, I've been uh, following the topic, Global Financial Safety Night, for quite a while. And uh, I'm so glad to see the data set and the panel of just introduced the two parallel data sets. Uh, try to catch the uh, dynamic of the you know, development and to understand how the safety net evolved in terms of the size, the coverage, tools, and institutions. And clearly, it is still uh, uh, an ongoing project. So I'm going to um, concentrate on the liquidity side of the topic and, and, and see how to improve the function of the global financial safety net. Oops. Well, actually, um, in times of a, a liquidity uh, a crisis, the global financial safety net uh, can play an important role. So this actually has been uh, tested several times since the global financial crisis, especially uh, during the time of the Eurozone crisis in uh, 2011 and 12. And this pandemic actually is another uh, opportunity to witness how it is functioning. And I think it proved that MF is obviously the center of the, uh, the, the network. And at the very moment of liquidity crunch, the Federal Reserve's dollar swap lines play, played an essential role. So I think this is fairly to say this time round, the liquidity crisis has been very much under control, um, at least um, at the uh, very difficult time in the beginning of the pandemic, thanks to the uh, quick actions taken by the key actors. 
So the problem is that the liquidity crisis is very much linked to financial cycle. So which means that it comes and goes all the time. And this time now, it actually is driven by a, 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 a policy moves, especially in the advanced economies, you know, in a, in, a, in a tightening cycle and the emerging economies have, have to deal with this spillover effects. So what options do they have? This is a sketch of the, uh, uh, the you know, supply side of this, 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 this uh, 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 scenario. And, and, and this is not complete, just a very uh, sketchy uh, concept of the uh, global financial net. What are the contents of this network? And um, basically, I think from the uh, national policy uh, point of view, the a country actually, you know, the first defense line, of, of course, is the international reserves. And uh, in many cases, I think for many countries, they just, you know, they have to choose between, you know, exchange rate uh, fluctuation or to, uh, you, know, you know, to manage the capital flows. Um, either way, they have to, you know, deal with the so-called policy dilemma. And this is especially the case for emerging economies, they actually get stuck with sort of a, a impossible triangle. So at a national um, uh, level, this is something, you know, they have to, uh, to, uh, to do it uh, in the beginning, but somehow, you know, it, it is impossible to, uh, to deal with the, uh, the financial shocks uh, coming from the external uh, international financial market. And then uh, the, the demand could go to uh, the cross-border actions. And then, you know, there are, this is the, what we are talking about a lot. The bilateral uh, swap lines and our, uh, regional financial arrangements and global ones and, and all those sort of uh, you know, network come together uh, and then they form this sort of architecture. Um, so the thing is, um, you know, when we think about the uh, the uh, the whole development, it's a sort of a beauty if you think of this this kind of uh, you know individual independent uh, 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 setup uh, because they each uh, uh, each source ha ha has a different mandate, governance, resource. And, uh, and, and I think they, they would really like to keep it sort of an independence, but somehow if you put them together and you will see a lot of, uh, you know, many things could be improved, especially we saw a lot of uh, gaps or if fragmentations, if some, some cases like co-founding needed. Um, so now I'm going to show you the, uh, well, this is something happened uh, last, uh, no, in the beginning of, of, of the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the MF action is really uh, impressive. And, and you can see this step-by-step step build up this sort of a support. And now it's, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's a, a very a functioning a, to provide universal uh, support. And then the FAT action, and it's very, um, you know, obvious that when the uh, the, the Fed, you know, uh, activate the, uh, the uh, swap lines. In fact, the, the Fed established a new temporary swap lines with with uh, you know nine other central banks, including four from this, the the uh, uh, emerging economies. And then you can see the clear correlation with the uh, the uh, the uh, fund co co funding cost. Uh, declining with the, uh, the, uh, the use of these swap lines. So now let's come to the, uh, the uh, gaps. I think uh, the uh, SDR actually has been discussed uh, 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 earlier and, and it's quite in details, but I, I just tried to uh, gather from the whole picture, gather what, 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 what had what are the most important uh, you know, issues that we need, need to discuss when we think about the whole uh, 
uh, sculpture or the whole architecture uh, design. The first, I think, um, the, uh, the, the most important one is still the uh, funding adequacy. So this, this issue actually uh, uh, has been discussed for a long time and, and, and there are many proposals to, uh, uh, to try to, you know, just either within the institutions or outside institutions to make a bigger uh, pooling of this funding. And there are also many esti uh, estimations of the, you know, how much uh, uh, demand could be and, uh, and, and the supply, you know, so we have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, regional and Martin uh, uh, components of the uh, uh, global financial signals actually, you know, we can calculate roughly uh, whether they match, uh, but the results are the same. There are a huge gap of, uh, of this, uh, uh, you know, if you compare with these both size. And one thing I think, uh, the key, uh, the key player are still is the IMF because IMF has been the most uh, capable uh, funding source and, and, and broader membership and uh, uh, very extensive tools to, to provide support. Um, now, you know, the, uh, we, we've been discussing the quota uh, issue. Quota basically is very important because the, the IMF is, is a quota-based institution. Uh, it's related to legitimacy whether the MF is fully funded you know, by the permanent funding, and I think uh, probably this is this is the time to uh, to uh, to uh, take uh, some actual steps because the Fed is is, is under the uh, the new round of a uh, uh, quarter general a general quarter uh, review, and hopefully we've got some new uh, uh, positive outcome. Uh, at the end. And another one is, is of, of course, the use of SDR. I won't repeat because Angel uh, talked this topic excellently uh, in, in a very details. Uh, but I think because this SDR issue has been discussed, I think since the very beginning uh, of its creation, but, but still, you know, the function is very limited. And there's no secondary uh, market yet, but but this time round, I think uh, it could be an opportunity uh, for the members to discuss, you know, whether we could rethink uh, of this uh, much underutilized resource that provided by a multilateral financial institution. Um, you know, the uh, the MF just created the resilient uh, resilience and and, and sustainability, uh, sustainability trust RST. I think the RST is very uh, uh, you know it's a very good start and just possibly open a channel uh, you know to recycle the the uh, you know the new SDR allocation in the first place. But um, in the later stage, could consider you know, bring more money uh, and then to, uh, you know, to use it for, um, for uh, uh, you know, resilience uh, element that climate or, or uh, some, you know, structure issues and, and more sustainable elements into this, you know, traditional liquidity concept tools. And I think uh, they're, 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 the door is open and, 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 and I hope, I hope there, there, there could be more um, discussions on this, and of course the uh, swap lines. You know, swap lines is, is is something, especially in a in a in a in a in a initial stage of liquidity difficulties, is very attractive. And uh, the Federal Reserve swap lines is most important one because of dollar status. You know, is all the financial centers. You know, is quite linked together with the dollar web. And, but at the same time, there are many other central banks, um, you know, they set up bilateral swaps as the Japanese, uh, the Bank of Japan, I think, has a lot of swap lines. People's Bank of China also set up some swaps. And all those swap li lines actually, you know, they are uneven, uh, 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 quite uneven in terms of um, geographical coverage. But somehow, you know, they touch, they are scattered uh, everywhere. 
So I think it is time to, to think whether we need to, uh, to do something to, uh, you know, through the uh, central bank's cooperation uh, to set up sort of a multilateral uh, swap lines. This issue has been discussed within the MF years ago, but somehow it didn't work out. But uh, I think with the growing numbers of swap lines, it's time to think how to use, use it in an efficient way. And the role of uh, regional financial arrangement, I think this is something I call it the missing link in this whole global financial safety net because you know, in, in the beginning, uh, because I, I, I work a lot on this two main initiative multilateralization, um, in the beginning, we designed this as the um, link between you know, national uh, foreign reserves and MF. It's kind of a bridge between the two supporting uh, a mechanism. But somehow, you know, it's, it's, there are a number of uh, uh, RFAs, but, but, but the usage is very different. And as a European, uh, ESM is the, the most active one, but the Qing Mai Initiative multilateralization is, is, is still you know, unused since uh, its, its, its introduction. And especially this time, you know, the pandemic, um, I think the only one country, uh, Myanmar, uh, 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 Myanmar is a member of the Qing Mai Initiative. Uh, Myanmar ap applied for the uh, support from the MF, but somehow, Myanmar didn't go to the Chiang Mai Initiative, so we reflect why, what, what, what are the reasons behind this? Well, the funding, you know, the adequacy is one uh, reason, but there are many more, you know, complicated reasons, especially for the, uh, the some of the regional financial arrangements. The linkage with the MF conditionality is one, and some others uh, problems with the efficiency. Um, but this is. I mean, the, the pandemic is a good opportunity for some of the regional financial arrangements to reflect, um, you know, whether they need to uh, to improve uh, well, with one another and with the MIF and, and also with the individual countries. But this is great resources if, in the, the whole global financial safety net. And last but not least, the surveillance. I think the Andrew mentioned is 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 the MF actually updated this um, uh, the uh, the surveillance tools is capital flow a the institutional view on liberal uh, liberalization of management capital flow. This is a very good start for fund to you know to update this uh, surveillance focus on disruptive capital flows. Because actually the fund has been intensively, uh, you know, studying on the, uh, the feasible toolkit of the macro prudential uh, capital flow management measures, and now I think it's time uh, to make more use of the uh, the sort of pre-empty policies to manage capital flows, especially in this you know turbulent time of tightening, and it's very useful as a guideline for many emerging economies. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Ai Hong. Um, we haven't got a lot of time left. There are, there are not questions. I, you know, having come listen to you both and, and just coming from the uh, IMF meetings, I mean, is it, I mean, yeah, Janet Yellen made an interesting point, I think, that we've, that kind of we've made ourselves in the past, that the system, actually, the system is not really designed to deal with the kind of systemic crises that we're talking about. It, it, she said it can't handle global crises. It's been designed to handle shocks country by country, but not shocks that hit countries simultaneously all at the same time. And she's then hinting at, although not really offering uh, options for what that would mean if we, we need to redesign a, the system to actually deal with the kind of systemic, and we're seeing now three systemic shocks in the space of, of 12 years. And, and so there is this kind of feeling that the system is not capable of actually really addressing them. The RST, for example, which is an important development, 
you know, it's it it can't deal with this emergency. It's it's long term financing essentially. It's it's not financing that countries you know you know Sri Lanka can't tap into the RST even if it was allowed to 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 access it, which it clearly isn't at the moment. Um, it, it you know that there's a real there's some real serious systemic issues that are still being circumvented. I think. Uh, in the discussion of the of the financial architecture and 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 I don't know if, if you've got any reflections on that maybe and I mean I, I the SDR issue is critical in this story I have absolutely no doubt UNCTAD as you probably know was fighting for its use beyond the sol the, the liquidity challenges back in 1970 so this has been a long this has been a long struggle and we haven't really found a solution yet but but i think i think there are some real systemic issues that we need to reflect on uh uh in a in a in a harder way to if we're gonna not repeat the kind of mistakes that we we, um, we saw after the global financial the global financial crisis and i thought it was interesting that yellen in a in a slightly you know in her particular way would would raise these kinds of would raise these kinds of issues. I don't know if it just by way of, we have a couple of minutes left. I don't know, Andres, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's important to uh, sort of reflect on uh, what's what's in uh, uh, Secretary Yellen's mind when she's talk, thinking about systemic issues, right? Is she thinking about sort of the Western world? Is she thinking truly in global terms? Is uh, she uh, really considering the asymmetrics <clears throat> uh, and the impacts, of, uh, differentiated impacts on, in terms of uh, what, what happens to developing countries? And um, I'm not sure that all that is present. I think that uh, what might continue to to me the most uh, uh, for sort of frequent thought in, in the minds of uh, certain policymakers is sort of the global financial system understood as the connection between these globally systemically important banks and large hedge funds and less sort of important financial markets, but not really the, the, the needs of, of, uh, of the people in developing countries in terms of their you know, needs uh, to, to purchase uh, food to survive or, or to uh, have a you know, more uh, opportunities in terms of the, their, their jobs and their access to education, health, and, and so on. So I think um, if, if the word sustainable development are excluded from that sort of thinking in, in systemic terms, then we're still going to be making the same mistakes, right? Because then they're going to think, all right, but we already have the C6 swap lines, you know, what else do you need for the global financial policy? when? That only takes into account 17% of the population, right? So it's only 17% of the population is covered by the Fed swap lines. That leaves 83% of the world's population outside of that sort of safety net that's been designed by, by the Fed. And, and even then, you know, do we want the US to be a, the, the exclusive, uh, you know, decision maker? Uh, for the entire system, or do we want this multilateral framework, which takes me again to the, the logic of SDRs. And, and of course, Richard Unktad uh, has, has been a, a very important voice, not just recently with the reports that, has been, that have been issued over the past few years, but literally for, for almost half a century now, uh, pushing, pushing the, the link uh, between SDRs issuance and allocations and development. So I think that we, we need to continue pushing that uh, forward. There has to be a lot of creativity in, in that regard. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, this is an opportunity to, to go in that direction. Thanks, Andres. Maybe, Hai Hong, you could maybe a little bit, you know, South-South arrangements, as you pointed out, have have begun to emerge. You, the new development bank has its own swap lines now. We have other mechanisms. Just maybe what opportunities you see in expanding those kinds of uh, arrangements to fill some of the gaps that we still have in the multilateral system. Right. Um, so let me um, first um, 
talk a little more about the SDR because you know uh, the SDR uh, by design is is sort of a, a, a liquidity management, uh, and now it's tend to be a more um, it's a completely different uh, dimension, and 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 this leads to a, a fundamental issue. Um, you know when we think about the liquidity and the solvency. But before, I think we have a very clear definition. And as you said, it's shock, shock linked to this sort of a liquidity uh, crisis. But solvency is much more complicated. Uh, and, and, and nowadays, I think it's quite difficult to, to uh, differentiate it. And I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of as your title of this a, 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 the event, you know, it's like, you know, looks like something just happened and then will be away but but somehow it's just stay longer than you expected and more deeper than you can see and this is something you know we we, we have to think uh especially uh i'm not sure whether my observation is right because you know the imf basically is 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 a is 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 a mandate is linked to this sort of a balance of payment um, crisis, which means it's more linked to the uh, you know liquidity side of this whole uh, 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 issue. Um, so the problem is now you know the IMF functioning is is actually extended a little bit more, and you know institutional uh, well. Wise, you know, the World Bank and many other developed banks, like you know, you mentioned the South South, the AIIB, or the New Development Bank, bank all those sort of is, is, institutions, you know, they have a, you know, it's a kind of tendency to be more similar in many ways. Uh, so before we have a very clear, you know, labor division, it's like, you know, this sort of a problem, MF is going to give a hand and then. We go to another uh, other institutions, but now it's, it's completely this out of date. This kind of uh, thinking. So, but the basic, I mean, it's probably we need to think more about this because if you want to have this sort of a whole a structure, you need some kind of labor division. Otherwise, you know, it's quite complicated. But but somehow you still need to uh, to have your own, uh, uh, you know. I don't know, it's, it's kind of uh, something, this is just the beginning, you know, it's, it's a new age and the issue is quite new, but but somehow we need to think more about this. Um, the basis the central banks, you know, has a physical, you know, physical uh, uh, task. This is more complicated, the monetary policy, the physical policy are more combined together. So this is a new age. So the in institutions, they, they think they need to think about this kind of you know so basic basic um, you know the mind side or mandate whether they need to expand it a little bit. I'm not sure whether my observation is you are in Washington. You tell me uh, what's going on there. <laughs> well, we're going to have to. I have a slightly more cynical view. I have to say, I hung the, uh, my you know my interpretation a little bit of Washington was. For, both the bank and the fund is that look we don't really know what to do about these crises but we'd like more money to implement them even though we don't know what we want to implement that that's that was my kind of takeaway i'm from a slightly cynical point of view um of of, of what happened in washington um okay look we we we're we're out beyond our time um, um, if, if penelope yeah if you got if you've got anything left yeah. Just to say, Sorry. we um, just two things. I did see that somebody tried to raise their hand. If you want to ask a question, sorry, you have to type it. Um, unfortunately, we can't give you the the opportunity to speak. Um, and um, we do have still till nine thirty, I think, unless I'm very much mistaken. So I think it was still wait. nine technically. Anyway, we've still got a few minutes, I think, because we started a bit late. But I just wanted to make the point that um, there was. You know the the point that you raise, um, Andreas, is to you know what is in the mind perhaps of um, uh, uh, Janet Yellen when she talks about things. I think is also related very much to our topic. Um, you know, when one looks out at the sea, are you in fact watching somebody waving or drowning? And I think if your interpretation is that 
I'm fine. And so therefore everybody else is okay. Um, there's often not the sufficient um, extension of support given to those who are in fact drowning. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, the, the work that we are looking at certainly in UNCTAD and becoming increasingly aware of, and as your excellent presentations um, emphasized, this is such an interrelated world, um, but it's quite easy to allow for the costs of the crisis to fall disproportionately on those who really can't afford it and who have the softest voices in the system. And so, um, you know, the, the, the thing that we have to continue to do is to raise the profile of those voices wherever we can so that they're not forgotten um, and that we, in fact, are listening to those who are drowning. So. Great, yeah, thank and to and also within the IMF context to better organize developing countries, the G24 is an important vehicle that needs to be strengthened, for example. Uh, and and UNCTAD, I think, has a role to play. I think the UN Secretary General in their efforts, in his efforts to try and track the impact of, the, of this particular crisis on developing countries has been important in terms of offering some solutions, I think, to the, to the current shock um, uh, uh, has also played an important role. I mean, there are, there are I, don't, I mean, I, I shouldn't be so cynical. There are initiatives out there. There are options out there that could be better used if the political intent and will was mobilized to more effectively employ them in support of developing countries. And, uh, and I think there's a job to be done in just showing that the system does have unused capacity or misused capacity um, to, to actually deal at, at least in a better way than we're currently dealing with them uh, under, uh, under, under current arrangements. So I think that's an important message that has to come out. I mean, I, we obviously we believe there are serious systemic holes in the system that need to be fixed, but there are things that the system can do that it has at its disposal that, that are not being as used effectively as they should be. And I think that's a, given the given the the emergency that some countries are facing right now. I think it's incredibly important to insist on. On, on using whatever we can to it to the full to be able to alleviate some of the stress on developing countries. I think that's a very important message that needs to come out too. I'm going to I look, I'm going to have to close. Partly I have to go across the road to the FFD forum myself. So I'm in a, a slight uh, uh, bind. But let me thank Andreas and Hai Hong for their contributions, Penelope too. This is ongoing work for people interested. Obviously, the work is available on the uh, UNCTAD website, but as Penelope said, this is, this is not finished work. This is ongoing work that we hope can in some way contribute to the efforts to build a, a, a financial system that is both more effective and much fairer in terms of the outcomes that it, that de it, it delivers. So. Thank you to everyone for participating um, and, and have, a, have a good rest of the day, I guess, a rest of the evening in Hai Hong's case. Um, uh, uh, and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.